Good morning. You know, when God called Moses to deliver Israel out of its slavery in Egypt, um, that task, uh, though God ordained and driven by the power of God, it came with some obstacles. One of those obstacles was Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now Moses came and he warned Pharaoh that if he didn't release God's people, God would send plagues on Egypt. But Pharaoh hardened his heart and he refused. And so God sent plague after plague, and still Pharaoh refused to obey God's command. And so finally, God sent a plague that would actually take the lives of many Egyptians. And as a sign to distinguish between Egyptian households and and Israelite households, God commanded his people to sacrifice a lamb and and actually cover their door frames with the blood of the lamb. And God said to the people in, in Exodus 12, he says, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Blood will be signed in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. The blood of the lamb was the gateway, if you will, to salvation and mercy. Now, this might seem to us now to be kind of a strange act to do if if we're being honest with ourselves. But it served as a powerful symbol and a precursor, if you will, to the lamb that God would one day send, not just to save Israel, but to save all who put their faith in him, the lamb of God. Now, if you've been away for a little while or if you're visiting here today, We've been going through a series which we've called The Wild God, and it's those passages of Scripture in which God actually, of all things, compares himself to an animal. And we've seen how God is like a bear, like a moth, like an eagle, like a hen. And today we see how he is a sacrificial lamb. And we see that in Isaiah 53. It's, this is represented elsewhere in Scripture as well, but we're going to be focusing on Isaiah 53. Let's read that together here now. Reading from the NIV this morning, Isaiah, on the operation of the Holy Spirit of God, writes these words. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was a and afflicted, he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Taken away, and who can speak of his existence? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was in a grave. He had no violence. There was an mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. 
Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressions. Transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The Lamb of God. Who is the Lamb of God? Well, it's Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And that is something that is going to become absolutely clear as we continue on through studying this passage here this morning. And what has the Lamb of God done? That also will be revealed to us as well. And what we're going to see here as we study this passage here together is that the Lamb of God came in humility. The Lamb of God suffered for others. And the Lamb of God rose in triumph. Let's just take this piece by piece. And there's a little bit of a background to this text. This is written, this passage is written by the prophet Isaiah. It was written roughly in the 8th century BC. And it's written to the southern kingdom of, of Israel. And the purpose of God speaking through the prophet Isaiah was to call God's people to repentance, to proclaim forthcoming justice, and to promise God's ultimate deliverance through the Messiah, which quite literally means through the anointed one, through a savior. Because you are at all familiar with the history of Israel's kings. If you were, <laughs> very many of them were. In. And that's the kind of place, that's the kind of time that Isaiah is ministering in and, and to. And it's in that time and it's in that place that God prophesies his deliverance through the Lamb of God. So the first truth we're going to examine here is that the Lamb of God came in humility. And we see that in verses 1 through 3. And interestingly there, you might be a little thrown off at verse 1. This prophecy, the is going to be believed by him. And neither will, will many receive the Lamb of God when he comes. And yet the word of the Lord goes out. We see in verse 2 the simplicity of the Lamb. He, and that is Jesus, grew up before him, that is God the Father, like a tender shoot. We see like a rut of dry ground. Hey, I'm not much of a gardener, but I at least know enough to know that nothing naturally grows from soil that is devoid of, of water, devoid of nutrients. And yet, that is where the Lamb of God comes up. Christ's birth, Christ's life is not natural, but supernatural. It's divine. Gabriel told Mary that she would give birth to this promised Messiah. Gabriel says this. He says, you conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Supernatural. When an angel told Joseph that his fiancee Mary was going to give birth to the Messiah, he says, this is Joseph. He says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. like a shoot coming up out of dry ground. So is the supernatural birth of Christ. And though literally the one and the only God King, Jesus came in, in humble appearance. You know, if it had been me, you know, I, I'd have sent Christ out looking great, you know? That Brad Pitt or that Henry Cavill look, you know? But that's not, that's not what God does. He appears in all humility, not just in human form, but even in just modest appearance. And when he does come, what we see 
in verse 3 is he's rejected. He's despised. He's rejected by many. He suffers pain. And what we see here in verse 3, not just a little, but a lot. He's viewed as a pariah, viewed as an outcast. And neither was he given the honor that he deserved. Friends, we need to appreciate the humility of, of the lambs coming down to earth. See, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, humbled himself greatly when he left his throne and came down. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2 when he says, Who, about Jesus, being the very nature of God, did not consider nothing by taking the very nature of a and being found in appearance as a man, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ came down an incredibly humble appearance in a humble way. And he demonstrated humility throughout his ministry, right up to the end of his earthly ministry. We see in John 13, Jesus knew the Father had things of his power. That he had come from God and was returning to God. That's what Christ knows, right? Now let's continue. So he got us in the last meal that he has together. Disciples for the cross, got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he put water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was around him. He came to Simon and Peter said, Are you going to wash my feet? No, I'm doing, but later, you will understand. That's prince. That is not what a king does. <laughs> You know, that's what the Lamb of God does. Humble in his coming, humble in his ministry. Mark me. This passage here in verse 2, that there's nothing in his appearance or his understand to stand out. To notice him or, or, or especially like him. You know, when Jesus begins his, his, his earthly ministry, when he's first starting out, we see in Mark 6, Jesus left there and he went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? Where are these remarkable miracles? What are these that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Nothing to especially draw us. And in that humility, in that ministry, Christ faced rejection, opposition, and even hatred. And in Luke 9, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. In Mark 5, we, we looked at this passage recently after Christ heals this man who'd been demon-possessed there in the Gerasene region. When they, the Gerasenes, came to see Jesus, they saw the man who'd been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. In Matthew 21, the, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant. And the translation is they were jealous. Jealous that he would do good things, the audacity. Finally, I just mock child, because that's really all that it was. And before the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah? Said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? condemned him as worthy of death. Humble. <laughs> humble and rejected. Humble in appearance, humble in vocation, humble in his coming, and yet rejected, opposed. Right. 
so that we could come to him. You know, there's a side to God that is pretty terrifying. The bear like God. And we're a little afraid to approach a God like that. And that is part of who he is. You know, we see a glimpse of that actually in Acts 20. You know, when the people are running and heard the trumpet and saw mountain and smoke, they trembled with pity of the Lamb of God. Makes us able to approach him. In that humble coming, in that humble ministry, in knowing what it's like to suffer, in knowing what it's like to be rejected, opposed, and hated, that's a God we're not afraid to come to. That's a God we're not afraid to come to. In Matthew 8, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him, and a man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Let me just pause real quick here, because if you're familiar with what God's laws were for, if you had leprosy, you had to tear your clothes, and you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. People had to keep their distance, and you were not allowed to fellowship. You were not allowed to be a part of the society. You were alone. You couldn't approach anybody, and nobody could approach you. And yet here we see this leper, coming up to Jesus. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Sorry. And Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. And he said, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. The guy who's not allowed to go anywhere, he's not allowed to talk to anybody, he's not allowed to touch anybody. Hey, he can come to the Lamb of God. Luke 18, love this passage. We referenced it many, many times, but there's a good reason for that. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. Hey, parents, you don't just bring your kids to anybody, but you can take your kids to the Lamb of God. See, when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. See, the Lamb of God is approachable. That's why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, he says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The Lamb of God is approachable. You know, if you, uh, if you go to Yellowstone National Park, um, Kim and I visited a lot of national parks for our honeymoon, and that was one of the ones that we went to. And if you walk around Yellowstone National Park, you're going to see these particular signs everywhere. And for the most part, though the verbiage might change here and there, it pretty much sends the message of, hey, keep your distance from the wildlife, okay? And especially when it comes to the buffalo or the bison, about 75 feet is what the park rangers recommend. Okay, and yet, interestingly, <laughs> with all those signs, with all those signs, it doesn't seem to stop people. As a matter of fact, just this last summer, three people got gored by buffalo, one of whom was a woman who got thrown 10 feet in the air. I love telling a good story. That would be like the capper story, but I don't think it would be worth it for the goring. I'm just, just saying. Friends, every year, one or two people get gored at Yellowstone. It's absolutely unnecessary, and almost every time it's because they just get too close to these animals. In fact, one person who was injured uh, back in 2015, they admitted later that they were trying to take a selfie with the buffalo right behind them. <laughs> Hey, you want that selfie? You got to pay the price. All right. Selfies aren't easy. You know, some animals are approachable and some are not. You know, bear, buffalo, moose, alligators, rattlesnakes. You know what? They're not real approachable. That's why you don't tend to see them at a petting zoo. Okay. I'm in the petting zoo phase of life. The day I see one of those at a petting zoo, I'm like, babe, we ain't coming here. Okay, we're not going there. Yeah, why? Because you know what? Some animals are approachable and some are not. Lambs are approachable. Lambs are approachable. 
Lambs are approachable. And friends, please understand this. So is the Lamb of God. Friends, I, I truly believe everything that I have for you here today is important, but if you're going to walk away with one thing, walk away with that. You can approach the Lamb of God. Amen. We do serve an awesome and terrifying God. If you don't think so, <laughs> you should read this, okay? And yet, and yet, we serve a God we can approach because of Jesus Christ. So come to him. Approach him. And you know what? In our own relationships with one another, calling ourselves Christ followers, let's have the same mindset as Christ. Humbling ourselves. And that word, back in the original Greek, to humble, it means to make a level plane. To make a level plane. It's not debasing yourself. It's leveling out. Humble yourselves. There's no untouchables in the family of God. And take on the very form of a servant. You know, in Mark 10, 45, I had a prof who quoted that passage probably almost every single class. But, you know, Jesus calls his disciples together and he says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but what? But to serve. Let's humble ourselves, level planes, and take on the nature of a servant. Hey, there's different kinds of servants. There's different kinds of service. But in our relationships with one another, let's have the same mindset as Christ. Trevor, that's a pretty tall order. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Praise God, the Lamb of, of God teaches us how to do that. That's why Christ says, take my yoke upon you and what? And learn from me. Learn from me. Let's continue. What we see in verses 4 through 10 is that the Lamb of God suffered for others. There in verse 4, we see that Jesus takes our suffering, our guilt, our shame, the punishment that we rightly deserve, and yet those, he, those who killed him thought he was actually getting what he deserved. In verse 5, we see that his suffering brings us healing. He was indeed pierced for our transgressions. We see that in John 19. But every blow, every lash, every nail brought us peace, brings us healing. In verse 6, we see that the lamb is faithful. You know, in Judges 17, in Judges 17 and also in Judges 21, the writer of Judges puts this little epitaph, I guess, for that period of, of God's people. It says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. And friends, I think that's a summary of the human race. Each and every one of us at multiple points in various ways has turned from God's way and has gone our own. You know, there's different words that the New Testament actually uses for sin, but one of those words is actually rebellion. We all have rebelled. But the king took the punishment that the rebels deserved and put it on his own son. Just let that one sink for a second. And yet what we see here in verse 7 is just this willing subjugation leading up to his execution. Jesus was mocked. He was interrogated. He was falsely accused. And yet he didn't return insult for insult. He didn't retaliate in kind. He remained silent, taking the punishment that God the Father had prepared for him. And in verse 8, we see that no one speaks up for the lamb. You know, when Jesus was arrested, no one spoke up on his behalf. No one championed him. You know, perhaps maybe John the Baptist would have, but John had been killed. Jesus' disciples, his closest ones, ran off. And in fact, one of them denies him three times that very night. And we see in verse 9, we see in verse 9 that Jesus is laid in a, laid in a tomb of the rich. Jesus was killed in a long and an excruciating and in a humiliating way. But when he did finally die, a wealthy man named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea took Christ's body and put it in his own tomb. Yet another way in which Christ fulfills this prophecy here in Isaiah 53. 
And here in verse 10, we see perhaps, perhaps the most startling part of this messianic prophecy. It is to me at least, because look, look at that wording. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Really? Yes, really. This was God's divine plan, one in which Jesus knew right from the get-go, and he reiterated throughout his ministry. But death was not the end of God's divine plan for the Messiah. Even though God offered up Jesus as a sin offering, God will extend his days and cause his will to prosper in Christ's hand. How will this be? We'll get to that in just a minute. Hang with me. Friends, Jesus did not only suffer at the cross. That, that was, in fact, a great time of suffering. But Jesus suffered throughout his entire ministry. He suffered thirst. Suffered hunger, suffered exhaustion, suffered temptation. And he suffered rejection from his family, from his hometown, and from his nation. When he did, after all of this suffering, when he does now come to the cross, his suffering becomes immeasurably worse. He's slapped and he's spat upon. He's abandoned and disowned. We talked about that earlier. He was beaten, mocked, whipped. He was made to carry his own cross. He was crucified, and then he was pierced with a spear. Why? Why did he endure all of this? Because God loves us enough to suffer greatly in order to reconcile us to himself. You see, that's what it means. <laughs> if you've just read John 3, 16, be like, well, that's nice. Friends, this is what it means. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. This is how he did it. You know, right or wrong, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Right or wrong, some animals are easier to see die than others, aren't they? If you're being honest, you don't have to admit to it, okay? I'll admit to it. It's easier to see some animals die than others. You know, that raccoon or that fox or that bobcat that's been killing your chickens, yeah, you're probably not holding a wake for that thing when it dies, okay? You know, we, we, we raised pigs and chickens growing up. You know, the pigs, after they've stepped on you enough times, after they've bitten you enough times, after they've knocked you over into their own dung piles enough times, you know what? You're kind of ready to see them go at the end. Those bulls that are kept alive to keep lines strong, I guess, but they're so stinking dangerous, they have to be in a pen by themselves. And anytime you approach the gate, they just ram it. Yeah, when he's finally sent to the other side of the freezer, you don't really mind too bad. You don't. It's just the truth. There's some animals we don't mind seeing go away, but you know, no, I, I honestly, I'd venture to say that no healthy human being wants to think about watching a lamb die. You know, <laughs> you look at them and they're just so young and innocent and sweet and gentle. You don't want to think about watching that die. Let alone do it yourself and and yet I think, friends, please listen up now. I think that is in part why God chose the lamb as a symbolic animal of his own son's sacrifice. Think about that for a little bit. Christ was pure. He was innocent. He was loving. He was merciful. He was just. And yet he died. And he laid down his life to save others. Now, I, I trust you'll forgive me for this and still love me for this. I've referenced Keller a lot lately. Um, I'm going to do it one more time for a while. I'm sure I'll come back to him later on. But, you know, Keller works in New York City, and, and he said here in an interview I, I listened to recently that one of the questions that he's asked most often as he shares the gospel with, with the heart of New York City is, <laughs> you know, most of this gospel sounds good, but, but why the death? Why the sacrifice? You know, well, that's, that's rough. Why can't God just forgive us? And I'm going to steal some of his stuff and I'll put in some of my own too, okay? 
But, you know, stop and think about it. You know, if your neighbor backs out of their driveway and crashes your car that's parked in your driveway, okay? Or, or, or suppose you're a boss and your employee blows a major sale that costs your company thousands or damages a piece of equipment that costs your company thousands. Well, in those kind of scenarios, friends, you've got two options. You can either make your neighbor or make your employee pay or you can fire them or you can sue them or you can forgive them and eat that cost yourself. Take away the financial aspect. You know, suppose somebody wrongs you deeply. I'm not going to entertain different possibilities. You know what it is to be deeply wronged, to be deeply hurt. You have the same two options. You can reject that person, you can punish that person, or you can forgive them. But if you choose to forgive them, you're going to be killing a little part of yourself. You're killing the part of yourself that wants to punish that person. You're killing the, you know, in that act of forgiveness, a small part of you dies. That part that cries out, punish them. I want vengeance. I want justice. Friends, that's the case for one grievance between two people. Imagine that kind of dying to self if it meant forgiving the sins of the world throughout multiple generations. Friends, that act of forgiveness would be monumental, and that level of dying to self would be enormous. And you know what? It is. See, God is willing to forgive all those who ask it of him. He's willing to be reconciled, but in his forgiveness, he killed a part of himself in order to make that forgiveness possible. It's through the suffering of the Lamb of God that God is able to say, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more. Jesus, the Lamb of God, suffered, and he suffered greatly. <laughs> and I hate to break it to you, but he tells his disciples that they're going to experience suffering too. And as a matter of fact, he even promises them that they're going to be hated for being his disciples. Whew. But by the power of God's Holy Spirit, the children of God have been made able to suffer well. Peter writes to the church, and, and, and this particular church that Peter was writing to, they were in the middle of suffering for being the church. He writes this, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, that is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We also... We also don't have to be surprised by suffering. Christ has promised us that it, it'll, it's a part of life, and it's especially part of life of being one of his disciples. But you know, not being surprised is, is helpful. That's why Peter continues in that same letter. He says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. By being born again through the Lamb of God, through his suffering, we, we've been made able to love one another. On that same night that Christ washed his disciples' feet, he says this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's why Paul writes in Galatians 6, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Friends, we've also been made able to forgive each other. 
That's why Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Third and final truth we're going to examine here is in verses 11 through 12, and that's that the Lamb of God rose, past tense, rose in triumph. In verse 11, we see life after death. Now at last we see how, how is verse 10 saying what verse 10 says? Well, now we see that for the son has suffered as the father has destined him to suffer, he will bring the son back to life. And this triumph extends to those whom Christ has justified through his suffering. And in verse 12, we see this righteous reward. God the father rewards God the son and the son shares the reward with those who are his. Because of the son's obedience, even to death, the son's actions justify many, making the sinner an object of righteousness and the rebel a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. See, Peter attests to the Lamb of God's triumph in his sermon to the people at, at, in Jerusalem there on the day of Pentecost. We referenced this sermon last week. We're going to bring it up once more here now. Because Peter says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Paul attests, to the Lamb of God's triumph and that same Messianic hymn that he writes in Philippians 2. It says, being found in appearance as a man where we left off there, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, why is Christ's resurrection so important? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but let me just give you two here this morning. First, it proves that Jesus is who he says he is. It proves that he is, in fact, the Messiah prophesied about here in Isaiah 53 and in many, many other places in the Old Testament. Friends, a lot of people have died for something that they believed in. None but Christ has God brought back after he's died. The second reason I, I'm going to argue here this morning as to why Christ's resurrection is so important, not only does it prove that Jesus is who he says he is, and that's critical, because if he's not, you have nothing. But secondly, Christ's triumph is shared with those who put their faith in him. Colossians 2 says, when you were dead in your sins and in, your uncircumcision, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. What? By the cross. Paul continues in Colossians 3, he says, Since then, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Why? Because the Lamb of God shares in his triumph. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you, brother. unless you've been living under a rock or are deeply un-American, you're, you're probably tracking that it's, it's football season right now. <laughs> right. 
And most of us, if you're a football fan, you've probably got a favorite football team. And we're not going to get into that today, sir. All right. But most of us have a favorite football team. We'll discuss that later and hopefully still be friends. And, you know, if you've got a favorite football team, if you've got a favorite sports team in general, if you've got a favorite sports team in general, whether it's baseball or basketball, you know, you track the starting lineup. You watch the game intently. And when your team wins, what do you do? You cheer, right? You're ecstatic. Your team won. And maybe you're not a sports fan. And I still love you. All right. Maybe you're not a sports fan, but you know, you probably have a favorite musician or you have a favorite actor or a favorite writer or something to that effect. And you know, when news breaks that that person is, is getting married or they're having a baby, you're happy for them. You're really excited. Why? Well, because in some weird, convoluted way, these people's victories are somehow our victories, but in actuality, they're not. Okay? Listen, listen. Nate, I'm so sorry, man, but if the Bills win the Super Bowl, they're not going to give us a ring, you know? Like, I mean, it's not going to happen. Yeah, if your favorite team wins the Super Bowl, they're not. Oh, and for your great fanmanship, here's one of the Super Bowl rings. Like, that's not going to happen. You know, if your favorite actor, your favorite musician has, has a baby, they're not going to call you and be like, hey, what do you think about for names? They're not going to ask you that. Okay? It might feel like our victory, but it's not really our victory. However, Christ's victory truly becomes our victory if we've put our faith in him. It's not fake. It's not just a feeling. Man, let me say that one more time. It is not just a feeling of victory. It is an actual victory that the Son of God shares with us. Friends, when the days become dark, and there are dark days, remember the light to come. You know, if you read through Isaiah 53 with fresh eyes, or maybe today, if this is the first time you've ever read through it, you know, you read through it, and if you're being honest with yourself, you think, how can this have a happy ending? And, you know, as, disciple, as Jesus' disciples watched him nailed to the cross, I mean, I'm sure many of them thought, how can this man be the Messiah? But, you know, we see now, Christ's disciples saw it firsthand, and we see now through the Spirit of God, he was in control the whole time. Friends, listen up. The situation had not gotten out of hand. It was in God's hands. Today, tomorrow, in the coming weeks, months, or years, when the days look dark, when they look bleak, when they look hopeless, hey, please remember, we serve this very same God. Rest in the victory of the Lamb. Hey, there are battles to fight, certainly. There are certainly battles to fight, but the war has been won. That's the kind of war I want to fight in. And by faith in Christ, friends, we are made to share in a very real victory. If you're already living a new life in Christ, the Lamb of God came in humility, and in that humility, He's approachable. We can approach the Lamb of God with confidence. So approach him. Come to him. And in our relationships with one another, let's have that same mindset as Christ, humbling ourselves, level field, and taking on the nature of servants. We won't all be in the same kind of service. We can all have a servant's heart. If you're already living a new life in Christ, the Lamb of God suffered for others. And by the power of the Lamb, we can suffer well and we can suffer as he has suffered. Not eye for eye, not tooth for tooth, not threat for threat or word for word, but with patience and prayer and faithfulness. We don't have to be surprised. We're, we're not going to be caught off guard by some right hook. We don't have to be surprised, and we can, we can love one another. 
bearing with one another, bearing up one another, forgiving one another. And if you're already living a new life in Christ, when the times are dark, remember the light is coming. We serve a God who turns tragedy into triumph and the situation, whatever it might be, it's not out of hand. It's in God's hands. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, very brief, I just want you to know this. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, the God of the Bible is approachable. This awesome and terrifying God is a God we can come to because like the perfect parent that he is, he came down to our level in order to bring us up. The God of the Bible suffered for you. <laughs> if you've suffered through the act of forgiveness, know this. Christ has suffered through the act of forgiving all who come to him in every generation. The God of the Bible shares his victory. The triumph of the Lamb has opened the way for us to become the adopted children of God. And if you want to be a part of that family, stop going your own way. Stop going your own way and turn to Christ. Receive forgiveness of all your sins, great and small, and be reconciled to God and follow him as the Lord and the Savior of your life. Now, let's celebrate the Lord's table. If you, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to join with us here in celebrating. If you've not done yet that, that yet, I'd ask you to refrain and also can, to consider why not? Why not yet? Will the elders come forward, please?